Thank you all for joining us for today's webcast, What's New from PDC, Windows Azure App Fabric, and Windows Azure, Windows Azure Connect, presented by David Pullman. My name is Meredith Mead, and I'm the Marketing Coordinator for Nudestic and the moderator for today's webcast. This webcast is presented by David Pullman, Nudestic's General Manager of the Custom Application Development Practice. If you are all logged on, you should be able to see a title slide that states Nudestic. There was a brief intro earlier regarding features within Live Meeting. To briefly recap, we encourage you to ask questions throughout the session by typing them in. To ask a question, click on the Q&A verbiage located in the toolbar on the top left side of your screen. Type your question, then click the Ask button. Please note, all questions will be held until the end. We will also be using the seating chart feature within Live Meeting. Changing your feedback color within this tool provides feedback to the presenter. To provide feedback, click on the feedback menu found in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. Select your color. Your seat in the conference center will display your selected color. Lastly, this webcast is being recorded and will be available via the NewDesk website. We will email you when the link is available. If everyone is ready, please make sure your seat color is green. At this time, I'd like to turn our presentation over to David. David, you may be on mute. I'm not sure if I can hear you. Still no audio, David. I'm sorry, everyone, for the technical difficulty. Still no sound, but try again, David. All right, everyone, we're going to try by phone. Please just hold on for one moment, and we apologize for the technical difficulties. <laughs> Hello. Much better. Thanks, David. Okay. Well, I'm sorry about that, everyone. I, I, uh, I would like to use my computer if I can so that I can uh, have two hands free for typing, but uh, it's certainly more important that you hear me than anything else. So, welcome again. Uh, again, my name is David Pullman, and uh, we are going to talk of uh, the second in a series on, uh, on what's new in Windows Azure. Uh, as you may know, Microsoft released a lot of new features at the end of the year, and we're covering them uh, a webcast at a time. Uh, today, uh, what we'd like to do, uh, first of all, uh, because we have a little bit, a little bit of extra time in this hour, I want to uh, give everyone an updated overview of the platform. Uh, the number of services has really increased quite a bit in the last year, so I want to make sure you have a good, good sense of what, uh, what is in the platform today. So it'll take just a few minutes to do that. But then we're going to delve into two services uh, that are new today. One is the App Traffic Cache service, and the other is the Windows Azure Connect service. So just to give you a quick uh, level set on the platform. Uh, it's still divided into three large primary areas, functionally, called Windows Azure, SQL Azure, and Windows Azure App Fabric. Uh, it is important to avoid the name confusion there. Uh, so one of those areas is called Windows Azure, but the entire platform is also called Windows Azure, so it's, uh, it's important to be uh, clear when you use that term. 
also on App Fabric, it's, we're, we're being very careful to play Windows Azure App Fabric because there are two App Fabrics. It's also a Windows Server App Fabric, and that coincidence the naming is not uh, not a coincidence. It's, uh, it's an intent to have the uh, the on-premise and the cloud versions uh, eventually have feature parity. So what's in these three areas? Well, one of the services in the Windows Azure portion, uh, perhaps one of the most important services, is Windows Azure Compute. This is the ability to have your uh, applications hosted in an Azure data center. And this service is, is distinctive from all the other Windows Azure platform services because the other services are ones that you consume, usually through HTTP REST or, uh, or .NET library. Uh, uh, but this one is distinct because here you're not just consuming the service, you're actually, your applications are actually living in the data center, uh, executing there as it's a one-time environment. In addition to Windows Azure Compute, the Windows Azure portion of the platform also includes Windows Azure Storage. This is non-database storage, available in the form of blobs, which are like files and queues and uh, cheap data tables that are not relational. The Content Delivery Network is another service in the Windows Azure area. It, takes, uh, it allows you to take a content and blob storage from the Windows Azure Storage Service and serve it up performantly around the world by using a network of edge servers that will automatically uh, cache and distribute locally uh, your, your content. So you might use that, for example, for things like image files or video files or downloads. Windows Azure Connect, this is one of the services we're going to talk about today. It gives you a virtual network connection between your assets in the cloud and your assets on-premise. It opens up all sorts of new uh, capabilities. This is in the community technology preview, meaning you can, uh, you can sign up to get access to the service, but it's not yet released commercially. And then Windows Azure Data Market uh, is a very interesting service for, for buying or actually selling even uh, reference data through the cloud. So it's, uh, it's if you purchase reference data currently, you might consider the subscription-based model. But also, if you have interesting data that your company provides that you want to sell uh, through the marketplace, you can actually use, uh, use this as a, as a way to make the cloud a profit center for yourself. And in the uh, second area of the platform, SQL Azure, we have the SQL Azure database. This is core database functionality. It's very similar to SQL Server um, with, with a few uh, caveats that not all the features are there yet, but uh, very, a very familiar experience. We have SQL Azure Reporting. This is a new service that's uh, very analogous to uh, SQL Server reporting services in, in the enterprise. It's also a community technology preview. The SQL Azure Data Sync service allows you to take your on-premise databases from SQL Server and your in-cloud SQL Azure databases and keep them synchronized. Or you can use it to synchronize multiple SQL Azure databases, even if they're in different data centers around the world. This also is in CTP. The SQL Azure O data service uh, automatically creates a data access service for your database, so you don't have to go create a web service. And it uses a uh, uh, emerging new protocol called OData, which is very easy for uh, different types of uh, apps and clients and devices to consume, also in CTP. That third area is AppFabric. So we have the AppFabric cache service. This is, again, one of the services we're going to talk about today. It gives you caching. And then two other services that have been there all along are the AppFabric service bus that gives you published described communication and particularly good for business-to-business -business scenarios. And we have the AppFabric access control service. This gives you federated security through a claims-based identity and supports really the, uh, the world security system. So there you have it. Um, if you took a look at the platform, say, a year ago, uh, you, what you should notice now is that the number of services have almost doubled. So uh, the Windows Azure platform is on the march. It is uh, always being uh, extended and innovated. Uh, the rate of progress and the, the, the capabilities we get are very excited. And so uh, without further ado, let's start talking more specifically about, uh, about some of these services. So from a timeline standpoint, uh, we got a preview of, uh, of, of this cloud computing platform, and, and the name was Azure came out in the fall of 2008 at the Program Developer Conference. We uh, got commercial release after a 16-month uh, preview period in February of 2010, so we're coming up on a one-year anniversary there. Uh, so version 1.1 was out in February 2010. Uh, about middle of last year, we got uh, 1.2 update. There was a few interesting capabilities, but uh, just now in uh, November, December, we got uh, what's called the 1.3 update. Uh, and it well could have been called the 2.0 update, uh, given how, how much it was in there. It uh, really doubled the capability of the platform, in my, in my view. So uh, uh, just lots of, lots of goodies. So again, if you take a look at it, Windows Azure, but haven't taken a fresh look at it, you might want to uh, might want to take take, uh, take a new look there. And there are plenty of great features coming in 2011 as well, we're told. 
So uh, this is part two of a three-part series. In part one, we looked at um, that there was a new 1.3 uh, software development kit. We looked at a new Silverlight-based portal. Uh, we looked at some features such as admin mode and startup tasks, which allow you to uh, install software and register components uh, before your uh, hosted services start up. We looked at the, uh, the remote desktop feature, which is great because it gives you a way to directly see your, your cloud machines. We looked at full IIS, which really opens up a lot more scenarios for hosting websites, especially multiple websites uh, in Windows Azure Compute. And we looked at a new uh, fifth uh, VM size called the, low, the, low, the, uh, the extra small size. Today we're looking at App Fabric Cache Service and Windows Azure Connect. And then in the third part, we will look at SQL Azure Reporting Services and the, uh, the VM role feature. So, App Fabric Cache Service, distributed memory caching. This gives you a distributed memory cache that your applications running in Windows Azure Compute can make use of. And this is based on something that, uh, that's actually been around for a little while on the Windows Server side. Uh, Windows Server App Fabric has uh, had a caching feature, put in Velocity, you may, you may know it by that name. Uh, and there are some differences and some similarities between these two features. Uh, mostly, they're, mostly they're similar. Uh, they have the same programming model. So if you have, if you have code you've been using with Velocity, Windows Server uh, App Fabric caching on premise, it should work just fine with, uh, in your Windows Azure applications using the uh, Azure App Fabric caching. Um, but there also are some differences. And one of the differences is nothing to deploy or host or manage. You just use the service. Microsoft takes care of where the servers are that, that actually implement the caching. So it's uh, just, um, just start using it. Very, very, very simple. It uh, enables you to have scalable solutions that have low latency and high throughput. And it is currently available, as we said, as a community technology preview. Uh, App Fabric has this uh, whole separate area for testing, pre-commercial -re -pre release called App Fabric Labs. And that area is where you can uh, uh, sign up to use the feature, test it out. So it's currently free to use. So some of the uses for the cache service, uh, uh, things you would typically, uh, so first of all, if you're doing website programming, um, session state or page output caching, Typical mechanisms you might have used in the past to uh, make websites, uh, websites uh, perform well can be used for that. But also can be used just for general purpose, any, any kind of caching you want to perform in any kind of application. So it's certainly not limited to, uh, to web applications. So the best way to think about app private cache is it's like adrenaline for your hosted service. Um, caching is almost something these days we take for granted, but uh, you know, I can say myself going back 30 years of computers, uh, I really can't think of any development uh, that we owe more to than caching for for uh, improvements in performance. Uh, these days, it's everywhere. It's on your it's on your uh, Windows PC. Uh, it's in the internet. It's on servers. It's on clients. It uh, it plays a huge role in your electronic life every day. And uh, uh, you certainly want to take advantage of it in your own applications that you put into the cloud. So this is a good time to mention something about, uh, just a reminder about the Windows Azure Compute. Your hosted services that you put in Windows Azure Compute, which would be taking advantage of this service, are running in a farm that in, the, in cloud computing, uh, there's sort of this uh, interesting, uh, almost kind of like a contradiction, but there's this interesting uh, mix of uh, reliability and unreliability that you have. So in a, in a, in a Windows Azure uh, Compute farm, you have your this hosted service, your application in the cloud, and you divide it into one or more roles, each of which is a uh, virtual machine farm with load balance. And that farm is both reliable and unreliable at the same time. What's reliable about it is that the, uh, the intelligent infrastructure is monitoring the health of your virtual machines and assuring, for example, that if you ask for three servers, that you have three servers, and applying things like patches and just uh, taking good care of you. However, the, uh, the actual hardware used in cloud computing is just good old commodity average hardware that keeps the cost down, but also means that things fail from time to time. So any, any given individual virtual machine instance could fail on you at any time. You're, uh, you're taught early on with cloud computing development and you can't rely on any machine uh, sticking around. So that's why we have this big emphasis on being as stateless as possible uh, and thinking of the role of the farm as being very uh, reliable to stay around. But the individual instances, like soldiers in an army or like ants in an ant colony, the individuals, could, you could lose them at any time. Well, that has implications for the other services you use beyond hosting. So if you're using SQL Azure Database Service, if you're using Windows Azure Storage, these services need to be hosted. They need to live outside your farm, outside your instances. Uh, and that's true of the, of the cache service. The cache is a distributed cache that lives outside your farm. It's not something, it's not something that lives on your VM instances because they, they can't be trusted to, to be persistent. And so uh, um, it's very important to understand how it's used there. And uh, again, this is, this is the model, the pattern for all 
all of the services beyond Windows Azure Compute. So we said that, though. Um, uh, the cache server does some interesting things for us. So if you think about latency and, and uh, the, the, the time to uh, access uh, data, obviously the uh, most expensive is disk. And uh, next up there would be going over a network, something like a distributed cache, like we're talking here. And uh, there is a cost, of course, of going over the network, but it's certainly way better than going to disk. Memory, of course, is the most attractive. However, as we just made the big point, you can't really leave things in memory because the um, the instances come and go. Nor is the uh, nor is the load balancer in Windows Azure sticky. So each client, even for a single client in a single session, you can't trust that they're going to go back to the same instance each time. They probably aren't. Uh, however, uh, the cache service is pretty clever. So it uh, it certainly gives us this network level access to a distributed memory cache that's better than going to disk. But it has a second level of caching you can turn on, and actually will also cache in memory in your virtual machine instances. Uh, and the reason that's okay is not depending on it. If something isn't found in the local instance cache, where it may or may not be there, um, then we move on to the actual distributed cache over the network. And so uh, you will occasionally get this boost from this second level of caching. So some of the features. First of all, if you are an ASP.NET website developer um, and you're used to using the session state or page output caching features, there are ASP.NET providers for you. It makes it very easy to plug in features you're already used to using with the, uh, the Appropriate Cache Service. For general caching, you can cache any managed .NET object. There are no limits on the size. And um, especially when you're using the local caching uh, level of, of it, there's no really no serialization cost involved. Uh, it integrates very easily into existing applications, and access to the cache is secured through the Access Control Service. So how do you set this all up? Well, uh, you do it through the portal. Now, if you uh, tuned into the uh, the first part of our series here, uh, we showed you a brand new portal, and it didn't look anything like what I'm showing you now. Well, the uh, the out fabric area of uh, of the platform hasn't hasn't transitioned yet to the new portal look. Uh, so they will. If you went in the new portal right now to the uh, out fabric area, it would it would simply give you a link to send you to uh, to this site. Now there actually are two out fabric portals. There is uh, the production one, and there's this one called the Labs Portal. I'm showing you here the Labs Portal, which is available at portal at appfabriclabs.com. This is where uh, new versions and new services are previewed um, for testing before commercial release. So right now on the uh, App Fabric Labs Portal, you'd find new versions of the Access Control Service and the Service Bus Service, as well as uh, new services like this cache service. So that's where you go to get it. And what you do is you set up a uh, project namespace for yourself, and uh, in there you'll see that you have uh, links to manage uh, the various services, including the cache service. When you go to manage cache service, if I'm actually it's uh, pretty easy to set up. There isn't a whole lot for you to do other than to uh, take note of some special values. You've got a URL for the cache service based on the uh, namespace you set up. You've got a port assigned, and you've got an authentication token. That's really how you control security to the cache. Also lower on the page here, you see uh, some configuration data. Let me let me scroll that for you here. Uh, the page gives you uh, examples of configuration that you would typically use in uh, .NET or ASP.NET code to uh, to do various things with the cache, uh, such as control session state or output caching or um, or general caching. Uh, so you can just actually just copy and paste that here to uh, to your uh, to your project and get going pretty quickly. For general setup, you would uh, copy that one of the areas that I just said to set up the data cache client. So you put, you plug in your uh, your service host name and your uh, port and your authorization token, uh, and then you start you start using it. And again, for uh, for general uses, it's it's pretty straightforward. You have objects you put in and out of the cache. They can be simple things like strings, or they can be really complex things like like an array of uh, customer objects, whatever you really want. And typical uses would be see if something's in the cache. If it isn't, then go get it from its original source. You could just use the cache as a, as, a, as a loan store also, but you have to keep in mind that things will eventually drain from the cache. Now, I'm not showing anything very elaborate here, but you do have control over uh, the lifetime of things you put in the cache. But you should also understand that the cache is a managed resource. Uh, once you get close to release, I'm sure we will get some control to Microsoft about what you want to pay for the cache service and how big it is. And so uh, uh, older items presumably will expire or you'll be able to set some limit on size. And so uh, really you shouldn't have a code with the cache Assuming I think you put in there will stay there forever. The, uh, the idea is to use it as a, uh, a valuable performance mechanism, but not really to rely on it for any kind of long-term persistence. 
if you were going to use the cash for session state, uh, you do just what I said on the portal page. You would, uh, would copy the configuration it gives you for your namespace and plug it into your config. And uh, there's a uh, the SDK. Uh, by the way, App Fabric has its own SDK separate from the Windows Azure SDK. Gives you a uh, distributed cache session state store provider that you can plug in, and you can use the ASP.NET session feature the way you're, you're probably used to. Very straightforward to use. So some of the importance of the App Fabric caching service. Uh, it is, uh, in my view, the single most significant thing you can do to leverage uh, for improving performance for your Windows Azure Compute hosted services. Uh, if you think about it, we have one type of hardware in the cloud. And you control your VM size, the number of cores in the RAM, but uh, you know, as far as grade of hardware, it is what it is. And as far as the service level agreement, which is uh, a little over three and a half lines, it is what it is. It's not like you have several tiers to choose from. So uh, what can you really do to uh, – and performance is, 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 is good, but if you need it to be uh, stellar, uh, the easiest thing, the most effective thing you can do is take advantage of the service. You're going to find that uh, makes a, makes a big difference. It's easy to use. Also significant because it's the first crossover feature between Windows Server App Fabric and Windows Azure App Fabric. So those two App Fabrics uh, up till now have had different features and a promise that they're going to cross over and have parity at some point. Uh, but this is the first actual example of that. So you have the cache service in both places, and, and it works exactly the same way with the same programming model. I'll call your attention to the Windows Azure Training Kit. This is something that Microsoft's uh, Developer Platform Evangelism puts out, and it's available on Azure.com under the Developers area. And uh, you should get it. Uh, what's in there are a bunch of uh, presentations and demos and labs, hands-on labs, for Windows Azure Platform. It's uh, something I've been using to go out and do a lot of training, and uh, it's really effective. And uh, so uh, if the lab in there on the, the cache server is pretty neat. It's got three parts. One is on session state, one's on general caching, one is on uh, creating extensible, reusable caching layer. The, um, the session state one's pretty interesting. There's an Azure Store application they gave you. It's an MVC uh, application for ASP.NET. And they have you, uh, it, has, it comes ready to run with a shopping cart. <clears throat> and then you can prove using the Windows Azure Compute Emulator that if you kill or restart your virtual machine, it's just that it loses its shopping cart because it's keeping it, it's keeping it in local memory. Uh, then you replace that using the distributed memory cache in the lab, and then after uh, running it again, you actually see the, um, the shopping cart persist. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very effective lab. It's uh, understanding is seeing the, uh, the difference here. I'll also point you to the, uh, the Microsoft PTC presentations, MicrosoftPTC.com. Uh, Wade Wagner did a good presentation on the, uh, on, on the cache server that you don't want to miss. I urge you to go see that video. So uh, to get it, you, you can either go to the, the new Windows Azure portal and go down to the App Fabric area, and it'll, it'll basically tell you to uh, link over to the App Fabric Labs portal, or you can go to directly, portal at appfabriclabs.com, and sign up, and you'll have access to the feature. So that's the cache service. Let's now talk about Windows Azure Connect. Uh, this one I'll actually be a little, uh, demo, demo for you as well. <coughs> So Windows Azure Connect is about giving you a virtual network connection between your, the cloud and your, uh, your on-premise machines. And uh, the number of the scenarios there that are, it's important for, which I'll get into momentarily, and it's very simple to set up and manage. In a nutshell, the idea is you've got some assets in the cloud that you're hosting there, and you've got some assets on-premise, and for one or more reasons, you might want to link them, and they are linked with a virtual private network connection, a VPN connection. So VPN is a technology we all are already familiar with and trust, and uh, so uh, all the things that are true of that are going to be true of this. You don't have to worry about security or anything like that. So what are some of the uses for Windows Azure Connect? Well, first of all, you might have apps you put in the cloud that still need to talk to systems that are on-premise. Uh, a canonical example of that is they have some web, app web application and it needs to talk to a database server. And um, for various reasons, those two parts one might make sense to the cloud, one might not. It might make sense for me to move my website to the cloud because the uh, demand on it changes over time or seasonally, and I, I can save a lot of money by using the cloud computing elasticity. But the database server that it talks to is also used a lot on-premise, so maybe I just don't feel I can move it out into the cloud without uh, some little effects for other reasons. Or maybe it's not running on Windows. Windows Azure Compute does require a Windows operating system. Uh, perhaps my database server is uh, something else. Uh, there might be all sorts of reasons why I can't necessarily move all of my solutions to yours into, into the cloud. So uh, some scenarios Windows Azure will, will connect will help here. Secondly, uh, I might want to take my, 
take my, my apps in the cloud and join them to my on-premise domain. You can actually do that. So um, that makes your application, your machines in the cloud actually subject to your uh, domain policies, which is pretty neat. So if you have an ID department that's sort of interested in the cloud, but maybe also a worried about it having control, um, the, the idea that they can join applications in the cloud to their domain and have uh, set domain policies that apply to those machines might give them a, a big comfort level. Third, uh, you might have on-premise infrastructure that you use to monitor and control your machines, for example, operations monitoring purposes or uh, deployment purposes, and you may want your assets in the cloud to play ball with that, with that system. Um, maybe you have a build system that deploys, maybe you have an operations monitoring system like System Center. Um, you may just want, may want uh, these assets in the cloud to be part of the fold, that they uh, conform to the same, uh, same rules of the road, and this will allow you to do that. So that's what I think about Windows Azure Connect is it's like the Berlin Wall coming down. Uh, we've had cloud computing, and it is fantastic. And we've had the nice, secure, isolated world of on-premise. And people have started to explore cloud computing and get interested about it, do a lot of thinking about what belongs in the cloud for us, what belongs on premise. Uh, but there have been two places. You know, there have been two places you think about. And now, now we have this, this, this way of uh, uh, connecting them, bringing them together in a, in, a, in a whole new direct way. And it's very exciting because it opens up all sorts of new scenarios. So uh, uh, from a technical standpoint with Azure Connect, uh, a lot of thought has gone into making this easy to, uh, to deal with. Uh, a lot of times the networking things can be complex, but actually Windows Azure Connect has uh, is been made pretty simple and approachable. What you do is you, uh, you create a number of groups. Uh, I show two groups here in my diagram, but you can have more than that. Uh, and there are two types of groups. There are role groups and machine groups. So role groups are, are machines in the cloud, and uh, it, it wouldn't work very well if you had to actually identify the machines in the cloud by name because the whole idea of, uh, of cloud computing is the number of instances comes and goes all the time. We're adding more, we're taking them away. And if you had to identify machines by name one by one, that, that kind of that, that wouldn't be in sync with the whole idea. So what happens in Windows Azure, you have your hosted service that has one or more roles. Each role is created into a VM form. Uh, and you make a group where you say, this role, you know, my, my presentation web role one tier of my web application in the cloud is going to be a member of, it's going to be in this group. And then all of the instances for that role automatically belong. And if you go and you add or remove instances, whatever number of instances you have, they just automatically, they're part of that role, and that role is part of the, the virtual network, so they just automatically enlist in the virtual network. Uh, however, uh, Windows Azure has had some rules all along for keeping keeping us all safe from each other in the cloud since it is a shared environment, and those rules are, uh, are still upheld. So, for example, you may you may know if already if you use Windows Azure Compute that not only are you protected from other uh, tenants' applications, but even your individual VMs can't see each other on the network. They're completely isolated. You know, you could you could do a remote desktop connection to two of your VMs that are part of the same role and the same hosted service, and they can't ping each other, for example. Uh, so that also applies. Your your VMs in a role group could be part of this network that can see, for example, your on-premise machines, but they still can't see each other. All of the normal rules of protection in Windows Azure Computer is still upheld. Now, on the machine group side, on-premise, on you create one or more of these machine groups, and in these machines you indicate by machine name which machines you want to be members. Uh, and there are the rules about them seeing each other are a little different. Those machines can see each other or not. It's actually an option that you can set so as you as you prefer. And as I said, I could have more than one group. I could show in the diagram several machine groups, for example, and that would be fine. So Windows Azure Connect, uh, you're going to see several ways of this virtual networking technology from Microsoft. And the first way that's out is, is agent-based. So uh, every machine that participates, whether it's in the cloud or on-premise, needs to be running an agent. So uh, and the way you make that happen is a little different for the, for the cloud side than it is for on-premise. On the, on the Windows Azure side, you have to enable an optional feature to use Windows Azure Connect in your hosted service. And then you've got to uh, uh, provide evidence of, uh, of authorization to do that by providing an activation token that you get from the portal. On your local machine, uh, also from the portal, you'll download and install a, a local agent that makes the, uh, the, the connectivity happen. So what that looks like is you um, look at the on-premise side. To uh, make a machine eligible, you, uh, you uh, define it in the portal as a, as a possible endpoint and you have this toolbar button, install local endpoint, which is going to give you a unique URL to download an agent fashioned just for you, for that machine. And once you install it, you're going to get this, uh, this Windows Azure Connect icon in your system tray there. And uh, it'll only look like this, or if it looks red, then it doesn't have a good connection. 
And that's what establishes the secure connection between your machine and the virtual network. Now, on the, on the, uh, on the cloud side, on the role side, uh, with your hosted service in your code, as you might recall, if you use Windows Azure Compute, you have both a service definition and a service configuration. Uh, Windows Azure Connect is one of these optional features for hosted services that you have to opt into. They're called plugins. And so in your service definition, you have an area called imports. And what you do there is you, uh, you add an import module name equals connect statement. And what that does is it enables the Windows Azure Connect feature. However, um, you still have to configure it with security for that to actually uh, be usable. So the way you do that is you uh, go back to the portal and you get an activation token. And that generated token you put uh, here I show in Visual Studio or if you want directly in the uh, service configuration file, you put in an activation token. And that's how the Windows Azure roles instances are securely connected to the virtual network. Now, you'll see there's a lot of other options here in the configuration. And that's for when you do the... Um, the domain join. When you get to the domain join, there are a lot of things you uh, you want to be able to control, and that's what that's all for. But for the general feature of being able to have the connectivity, all you really need is that activation token. For managing your network, you simply set up these groups. These uh, you uh, you uh, define these machine endpoints to make them part of a machine group. You link your machine groups to your role groups, and uh, and it becomes pretty simple. You uh, you have various uh, commands here to manage the network, such as uh, adding or removing uh, endpoints from groups or changing the linkages between them. But this is where you do it. There are some limitations. Um, first of all, you can't span subscriptions. What I mean by that is you do this in the portal underneath a, a Windows Azure uh, billing subscription. Um, so you could have multiple machine and role groups, but you, they all have to be part of the same subscription. So one of the things you can't do is you can't take a role group in your current subscription and a role group in some other Windows Azure subscription and somehow link them. You are, you are scoped by that subscription. Uh, secondly, you are, um, for the machine groups, you are opting in. You're identifying machines by name. And so what you can't do is you can't have a whole region of your network that automatically is a member of Windows Azure Connect. Now, that is something we're expecting them to uh, in subsequent waves, have more capability there that might be more uh, more broadly managed. But today, with a machine group on premise, you've got to identify your machines one by one by name. Also, because this is agent based and the only agents available are Windows based, it does limit you to Windows machines only. So uh, this is not going to allow you, for example, to connect to a machine on premise that's uh, linked to other operating systems. At least not today. You should also keep in mind that you are going over the Internet for this, and uh, the, all of the things that we already know about VPN connections are still true here. They, they are going over the Internet, and uh, you may have reliability issues to code for, or uh, you may want to consider putting the retries and that type of thing. Uh, these, these types of connections can come and go. And as I said, you expect more in the future. This is only the, uh, the first wave of virtual networking that we're getting. So let's, uh, let's demo this one here. Uh, I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm going to show you a compressed demo from the, um, the Windows Azure Training Kit Lab for this. And what that does is it takes a simple ASP.NET application, and it, um, it's a simple uh, ASP.NET MVC application that has a data control, and it is talking to uh, a simple SQL Azure uh, customer database. Let me uh, bring that up here. The idea here is our starting point is a, is a simple SQL, uh, SQL Express database and a simple ASP.NET application with a data control that talks to it, about as simple as you can get. And the idea is you're going to move, you're going to split that. You're going to move the, um, the website to the cloud. You're going to keep the database local on your machine, and so they're going to work together. Sounds like magic, but from the Azure Connect, it's quite possible to do. So you see here in SQL Azure Express our customer data, simple customer data like name, company address, and such. And here in this uh, uh, application, let me run it locally here. We are running locally, and obviously it uh, works just fine, and uh, no, no big issue there. So what does it take to turn this into something that can, where you can move the website into the cloud, and it can still talk to your uh, SQL Server Express database locally? Well, the first thing that you do and again, you can do it yourself at the lab. First thing that you do is you take a look at your config file, and you find your uh, connection string to the customer database, which is in here somewhere. There we go. Connection strings. 
And you'll see here for customer entities, we have actual string that says data source is dot backslash SQL Express. Uh, what we actually do when we put that in the cloud is we change that to a machine name. Your machine name. And you all, might also put in, you all put in your, there your uh, port, 1433. You can be going over the cloud to your machine on port 1433 and make this happen. And by the way, that's not going to work by default, so you're going to have to open up some, some things. Uh, both Windows and SQL by uh, default are pretty secure, and so you've got to uh, set up rules to enable this. So you've got to consider that security. Don't, don't be concerned about that. You're still in full control of uh, what's being opened up here. But this is one of the, one of the things you have to do, of course, because dot that wouldn't, have, wouldn't be the right place once we're uh, separated. And then uh, we, of course, have to deploy our hosted service to, to the cloud. And since that takes 20 minutes, I've gone ahead and, and done it already. It's like one of those cooking shows where you have the, uh, the trucker coming out of the oven. And I have that up here under hosted services. Customer search. So here I have this uh, this cloud link that uh, after I've uh, deployed it there, two other things I have to do. I have to um, I have to create a firewall rule to allow port 1433 to be accessed to the Windows firewall on my local machine. And I also have to do, I won't do it now, but I also have to go to uh, configure your SQL Server Express to allow uh, remote remote access over port 1433. So after I do all those things, I should be able to do it. And to uh, before we try running it, to prove that it's uh, real here, I'm going to stop my SQL Server Express service on my local machine. So it's stopped. So now when I when I try to hit this side of the this hosted uh, website out of the portal, I'd expect that to not work. Works, I'll be surprised. And you can see it's not connecting, it's not working, and it'll, uh, it'll time out soon enough here. So now to, uh, to show it working, let's go back here and start up our service, SQL Server Express. Okay, we're up and running. And now we're just going to uh, refresh once or twice the, uh, the cloud connection here. It uh, should work. There we go. So, oh, wow. Here we are in, uh, here we are with something that's hosted in, uh, in the cloud data center, accessing my local SQL Server Express database securely. Uh, nobody else can horn in on the conversation, so it's, it's safe, and I had to authorize it. I'm in control of it. Uh, but it's something I could do in the past, and so it uh, opens up all sorts of new uh, new vistas for me. So I want to tell you a little story. I, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was uh, helping uh, helping uh, with uh, uh, the Women's Agile training effort around the world, and I, uh, I uh, did a few training events in, uh, in various cities in the United States and Europe, and I was on kind of a whirlwind uh, schedule here. And so I was in uh, Los Angeles doing a two-day event on uh, using the Women's Agile training kit, and uh, for my session on uh, what is Azure Connect, we did this lab, and I demonstrated the same demonstration I just gave you. And my, uh, since I reside in California, the best data center for me is Texas. So in San Antonio, Texas is where I host my service, the one I just showed you. Uh, but uh, immediately after finishing up that event in L.A., three hours later, I was on a plane to Germany. And uh, once there, uh, I didn't really have time to, to reset up the demo locally or anything like that. I just needed to try running the same demo from my same machine, my same laptop, the same one I'm using now in Germany, with my website still being over there in San Antonio, Texas. And it worked superbly. I, uh, you know, my virtual network moved with me. So um, that's not really surprising. That's how VPN technology works. But uh, still just experiencing it. Uh, just, wow, I can go anywhere in the world and this virtual network connection between my local assets and my, my cloud assets, it works. And it even works spanning continents, and you know, I didn't have any kind of connectivity problems. So uh, I was just really thrilled to see it and experience it. So the importance of Windows Azure Connect. Uh, it makes more scenarios a good fit for the cloud computing. I used to, uh, when I would do a cloud assessments, which I do often, I used to uh, talk about to people about patterns that, that lent themselves well to cloud computing and some anti-patterns. One of the anti-patterns was what I used to call the, uh, the molar pattern. Uh, when you have an application that has a lot of internal integrations, it's almost like moving it to the cloud is almost like trying to extract a uh, tooth with a lot of deep roots. It's hard to do or it's expensive. 
Um, but now that's an easy scenario with Windows Azure Connect. Now it's just a, it's a slam dunk to access internal systems. Uh, again, keeping in mind that you have the internet latency. That may not be appropriate for all the situations. Uh, this is also one form of what people, when people you might have heard the term private cloud, which has about four different meanings. Uh, but one of them is, uh, is this type of connection where you, or sometimes you go to the term hybrid cloud, where you've got things in the cloud and things on premise and you're being able to, uh, uh, couple them as tightly as you want and, and, and use them together. So this is great for allowing the cloud to securely access your internal systems without you having to develop things like web services or other, uh, other ways to accommodate those connections. This is great for you being able to control your machines in the cloud by setting domain policies and having the machines in the cloud join your domain. And this is great for letting you uh, leverage your existing infrastructure, such as for uh, build systems, or op deployment systems, operations monitoring uh, against the machines in the cloud. So lots of, lots of good scenarios that open up here. As I mentioned, there's a uh, training kit with a good lab connected with Azure, and uh, it's uh, sorry, the picture's here wrong. It's the demo I just showed you. It's the uh, customer list being accessed uh, from the SQL Server Express database on your local machine. So how do you get it? <clears throat> well, you can go to the uh, the new portal, go to the home beta programs area, and you can sign up for this uh, feature. It is in Community Technology Preview, which means you have to sign up for it and wait to uh, to get admitted to the program. Uh, and that may, that may take a few weeks. So uh, if you're interested in it, you should uh, sign up as soon as possible. Okay, well, today we, uh, we did a little bit of a, a level set on the platform what's in it, but we uh, took a look at the cache service and the Windows Azure Connect service, and we were able to demo the Connect service. And the third part of our series, which I believe is next week, uh, we're going to look at the VM role feature in Windows Azure Compute, as well as the new SQL Azure Reporting Services feature. And that will wrap up our uh, three-part uh, series on what's, uh, what's new in Windows Azure. At this point, we're open for questions. Thanks, David, for this awesome presentation. Just as a reminder to everybody to ask a question, click on the Q&A verbiage on the top left side of your screen, type your question, then click the Ask button. One of the questions that came through was, can Azure App Fabric be used with on-premise applications? Can Azure App Fabric be used with on-premise applications? Good question. Uh, Microsoft's official description, you know, slideware, actually says it says it's for Windows Azure applications. So that raises the question that maybe it wouldn't work with on-premise. Um, I'm not sure of the answer, but I guess I would think if you're doing on-premise that you would use Windows Server App Fabric Cache. That seems to me that would make the most sense. Um, if you're going to use the Azure App Fabric Cache, you would be going over the uh, over the internet. So to me, that I not like the latency there. Thanks, David. So the second part of the question was, is the Azure caching service located in the same data center as that of Roll? Does that make sense? I can reread it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, so I, I, uh, um, I'm pretty sure that when you set up a, 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 um, an App Fabric account for things like cache as well as the other services, that you uh, select a data center to be in. So uh, that's actually a pretty important principle in cloud computing because most solutions are going to use more than one service. And so if you didn't have a way to, to control the data center for each, then you would have potentially a, a bad situation there. So the, uh, the actual feature that you'll see that uh, crosses many of the services is called affinity groups. So, for example, if you created a hosted service for Windows Azure Compute and you select the data center, you can also create this thing called affinity group. It's just, just a name, a label, that but all projects with that label, have, that affinity group, have to be kept in the same data center. And so that's really the mechanism you would use to ensure that uh, your various, uh, various services that you set up are all in the same place. Thanks, David. That sounded helpful. Another question was, regarding the App Fabric cache service, how do you control how long the data stays in the cache? Ah, great question. Uh, well, I think that there's two mechanisms. Uh, the first is uh, you can set um, you can set expiration, you can set lifetimes on the things that you put in the cache. So if you want them to be cached longer or shorter, you certainly can control that programmatically. Uh, there's a second aspect to it that I can't speak to yet because we don't know yet what the uh, the actual controls or, uh, or uh, uh, pricing model even is going to be for the, for the cash service. And so uh, I have to imagine that we're going to have some way of saying that you either want a ceiling on the, uh, the size of cash storage or the, or the amount you're willing to pay for it. And so that suggests that there'll be uh, that older data will just kind of automatically disappear from it. Uh, we don't have those details yet. So can't, um, I'm, I'm sure you'll have some sort of control there, but I'm not, I'm not sure what it is. But the, uh, the, the more immediate answer is, your, your program code can set a, uh, an expiration time on things you put in cache. Thank you. 
All right. If anyone has any more questions, please feel free to type them in at this time. In the meantime, I'm going to click through a few polling questions, and we would greatly appreciate your feedback. The first question, was this content helpful for your business? Yes or no? Great, thank you everyone. Second question. Please rate the presentation content. Excellent, good, or poor? Thank you. Last question. Would you like us to schedule a follow-up? Yes or no? Great. Thank you, everybody. If there are no further questions, we'd like to thank David again for the wonderful presentation. This webcast is a part of our post-PDC webcast series. The next webcast, What's New from PDC, SQL Azure and Window, Windows Azure VM Role, will be hosted on January 14th. We will be forwarding out more information about this webcast along with a link to the webcast recording. I'm just going to pause. We did have another question come through, and I want to make sure we can answer it. Um, David, the question is, do you get a notification when something is removed from the cache? Get a notification of something's removed from the cache. I believe that, uh, so I'm not a cache expert. <laughs> I believe there is a notification feature. Uh, I, I, be, I believe I read something that the notification feature may not yet be enabled in the uh, in the Azure uh, cache. I think you may have that feature already in the Windows Server cache. But uh, I would defer to the documentation on that one. Thanks, David. All right. And if anyone has any further questions, do you have your email available, David, for people to uh, write down? Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, david.palman at desert.com, or actually what's easier is, uh, um, I don't know if it's still displayed, but the um, David Pullman at blogspot, blogspot.com is the easiest way to uh, get hold of me there, my blog. Perfect. Thanks, David. Again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on our next webcast. You are now free to disconnect. Thank you.